It's got pie in it. I like it. Fill a pie. In. <laughs> Chapter one, and we are moving madly forward, are we not? Um, let's just do 24 through 26 here. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me for me by my coming to you again all right so the last statement that I had made in the last class was why would Paul make such a choice why would he go against his own desire why even though that that desire was um, and come on folks that desire is that he's going to gain more of Jesus. Right? And he gave that up. Now that doesn't even make sense, but folks, there are people who have given up their opportunity to have more Jesus so that others would get more Jesus. They have. I know they have. And it's because of a comprehension, not of what's better for themselves, but what is the Lord? What is, more specifically, what is? It is almost a definition. What is Christ crucified? What is that? Okay? So why would Paul make such a choice? For Paul to die sacrificially for the needs of others is seen as a higher form of death, for it is not self-focused. Okay, both are a death. Both of them are gain, but he sees this as a, okay, let's, let's hear it, because, you know, most people are just trying to convince people to even consider going the way of death, right? But we're talking to people who understand that, and it's getting even clearer. Not just any death, not just to die as gain, period. But rather, there is, shall we say it like this, a more excellent way. A more excellent way. It is a higher form of death, for it is not self-focused. The situation of who benefits most is the determining factor in Paul's mind as to which death is higher and which he will choose. And he proves that in verse 24. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. He's making, he, he has a framework. He has a pattern. He has, a, he has guidelines that are built within him that he believes are more Christ crucified than just any death. Okay? I'll say it like that, even though that's not the best way of saying it. However, it must be seen that in either case, dying is not viewed as negative but a positive force to bring about something greater, okay? And both of them are a positive force to bring about something greater. In other words, he chooses a death to self over a death that would strictly only benefit himself because of its positive impact for others. That's why, because our statement is, why would Paul make such a choice? Do we, I mean, do we comprehend the, the, the clarity with which Paul moves through life and he, he's, he, he faces this decision or this obstacle or this thing and he has a pattern and he has a clarity of Christ crucified that is not strictly and only bound up in the atonement for sin but it is Christ crucified the lamb on the throne, if you will. This, let's put it this way. It is Christ crucified, the slain lamb on the throne. Right. Um, <clears throat> but he chooses a death involving no personal gain because, no personal gain because, Wait a minute, this personal gain is gaining Jesus. What's the, what the heck's wrong with you? 
He chooses a death involving no personal gain because for him it would have been a choice that was more self-centered than the other one. He lines up with Christ crucified, sets his course according to the pattern, and embraces a crucified path. Okay. Not, not making random choices, not making decisions based on all of the elements. You know, here's us. Well, I, let me weigh this side and then weigh that. And da, 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 da. He knows what he's going to do. He's going, you know. And, and in some cases, folks, somebody, I'm just giving you an idea, somebody may need to get aside and go more for the Lord so that ultimately they can do that. And you know, Paul did that in the early going. Paul did get away from everything. He didn't stay with others because he didn't have enough yet. Does that make sense? And that was, that was the best decision because now the same guy, years and years later, he's not just carrying the message of Christ and him crucified. He is carrying the spirit and reality and essence of Christ crucified because that's who lives in him. That's who lives in him. Um, that's it. I think I got that. Yes. All right. Verse. Uh, let's go to verse 27. Can you feel it? We feel like we're getting close to the end of this chapter. Only let your conduct be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else it be, be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. All right, so let's just hold that. Um, you know, I, I, I see that we're making progress because I'm doing a lot more reading <laughs> instead of talking. <clears throat> and a, a lot of this the Lord gave me today. So it's fresh off the presses. You can still smell the ink on the paper. Paul begins to turn the subject to the reason for which he wrote this particular letter. He is setting up his subject by using terms such as what becometh the gospel, stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. These are all highly significant phrases. In the second chapter, not this one, but soon we're going to be in the, same, in the second chapter. He will more clearly define these terms, but he wants them to see the pattern of Christ that he has been following and to carry it on also. For Paul, what is, be, what is becoming, using his phrase, what becometh the gospel, what is becoming to the gospel is a manner based on selfless giving. To stand fast in one spirit with one mind will be seen in the next chapter to involve the elements of the cross and of this sacrificial mind of Christ. This act of striving together for the faith of the gospel will be the unified search to grasp and function by a faith that believes in life out of death. Let's read 28 to the end. And in nothing be terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. <laughs> Does that sound crazy? Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Anybody ever read these scriptures and went, what? <laughs> um, verse 28. Uh, and, and again, let me just read this. For example... Even as his imprisonments have not only not terrified him, <laughs> but turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, 
So he wants them to operate by this same principle. He says that to not be terrified by your adversaries should be due to your understanding of the fact that trials, losses, and death when done in the spirit of Christ can only release further glory of which others will partake. But on the contrary, your adversaries will see your lack of fear concerning the afflictions that they send your way as an evident token that you are a reprobate. Why? Because the average person would fear such things. But you not only allow for them, but look forward to them with the hope that there will be a greater increase of Christ based on your faith that life comes out of death. This is the meaning of salvation and that of God. And, you know, he, he referred to that over in, uh, what is it, verse uh, 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So here again he's talking about um, uh, having the same, no, it's, uh, but to you for, of salvation and that of God. Because he is still carrying on this same scenario that their existence has come about based on two things. One, Christ literally crucified, dying, bearing their sins, being blamed for their sins, being looked upon as if he did what they did. You follow on that? That's one element. And the other one is that Paul came to their city, was thrown into prison, falsely accused, and um, punished. And Paul did that in the same spirit that Jesus did what he did. And as we saw, Ye all are partakers of my grace, is what he said. Because he entered into a death, they entered into the resurrection of it. And so Paul is continuing to move forward, and he's talking about this, this reality of, of this, uh, this joy. And remember we talked about this is the most joyful letter in the New Testament, and he is continually referring to the joy. And the joy over the fact that Though these imprisonments, both of them in, in Philippia and Philippi and where he's at right now, he sees them not as setting back the gospel. Okay, come on now. It's hard to break out of the theological story of this. If only you could see a man totally dedicated to carrying the message of Christ to the world, limited, thrown into prison. Now you can't preach to anybody. Now you can't go. Now you can't do all this stuff. You know, now you can't reach the multitudes. Now you can't go to new cities. Now you can't. And there was so much going on and so much breaking forth, and now he's thrown into prison. And... What do you do? Honestly, when your heart just beats to reach people, I'll tell you what you do. I'll tell you exactly what you do. You come to a new understanding. You better, because if you don't, you'll pine away in prison. You come to a new understanding, and that new understanding is that life comes out of death. That new understanding is this shall turn to the furtherance of the gospel, and you guys are going to end up being partakers of my grace. This is not bad. This is good, and that, that's good. Thank you again, brother. So you embrace the death. Now picture, picture a man sitting in prison, maybe in a cell where he can't even talk to anybody. <clears throat> he has a few visitors. And he's thinking, you know, they, they could kill me. And it would be over with. It happened that way for Stephen. And i just going to reap what I sowed. You know, I mean, you know, does anybody ever have 
thoughts go through, con condemning thoughts go through your mind, you know, and maybe this is my end and everything within me wants to just go and preach and share and, and, and watch new people come to the Lord and, and all this stuff. And, but instead of entertaining condemning thoughts, some of you are kind of going, yeah, I guess I do, you know. The condemning thoughts come and you go, let me entertain you. <laughs> come right in. Let's, let's talk about it. <laughs> no. Instead of doing that, and you know, there, you know that there was a struggle somewhere along the line. You know it. But somewhere along the line, in all that wrestling, he realized that this cross thing that he was preaching could be the actual way that he could proceed by. So he's sitting there and he's going, okay, well, I'm just going to go into death. So, you know, he's just, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go into death so that other people get life. So he's sitting there and somebody says, you know, somebody visits him and says, well, I'll, you know, how you doing? Well, I'm just, going into death and stuff and they're not going to let uh, the guy says they're not going to let you out for a long long time he goes okay and so the guy visiting him says well you know here here here's some paper maybe you can you know write a few people and stuff dear philippian church dear colossian church dear ephesian church Dear Timothy, dear Titus, he wrote the Bible. <laughs> We're, we would sit there and whine and cry and go, this ain't right, I need to get out of here. This, you, know, you know, we got idiots out there that are free preaching, you know what I mean? And they're telling it wrong. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. And I'm the only one with the true revelation of Christ and I'm sitting in prison. God, what is, what, you know? But instead, somewhere along the line, he entered into that, and the whole spirit of that, if you will, if I may put it this way, the whole spirit of that went right down his arm, right through that pen, right onto that paper, and he wrote this book of Philippians from prison in that same spirit, encouraging free people that if I can live here, you can live here. Did I see a hand yet? The prison Philippians, or was it uh, the uh, in the out in the mountains in the desert studying, or was it all was it all kind of mixed in together? No, no. The, the out in the desert was first because that's where he came to a revelation of Christ. And then, then, wow. Yeah. But you do, you do realize that the revelation of Christ doesn't come instantaneous and fix everything. That there is an on, the revelation of Christ is ongoing. And, you know, I, man, I began to see Jesus when I was in Bible school and it was the real thing. But it took me, because, because years later, <clears throat> that same thing happened to me. And I was an assistant pastor in a church, and the guy wouldn't, he always preached, and he never let me preach. And I kept being in the Word, and it's like, you know, a new wineskin full of new wine, and I'm going to burst all over the place. Give me an outlet. And I was sitting in my little office in our little mobile home in 1980. Because it was. And it was hot. It was longer than this one. <laughs> About two days. <clears throat> and I realized the only outlet I have is to write. I started writing books and stuff. And that's where many of the books that some of you have read came from, was I just went, you know, well, I can do this, you know. Paul did it. And, and I felt like I was in a little cell. <clears throat> But you can't just go, well, bless God, I'll just write books. You know, can, you know do you have any clue what that's going to communicate to people? 
there is a spirit of the Lord and, and he initiates through you out of, a, out of a death that you've embraced. And that's where the pages are filled with life. That's where that comes from. You go, well, I'm just gonna pray harder. Well, I'm just gonna be more dedicated. Yeah, like he needs more of you. Yeah. Now, Lord, you got me, but I'm even more dedicated to going this way. <laughs> and he's going, would you just get dedicated enough to go to the cross so we can be done with your dedication? <clears throat> All right. So, um, <clears throat> for example, even as his imprisonments have not only not terrified him. Let's see, did I read this whole thing? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, so basically, he's saying that um, uh, it, d don't be terrified by your adversaries. There are people that are going to be out to get you. There are going to be people that they don't even know why they hate you. I mean, that's just a fact, you know. There are, you know, Paul, do you remember the story with Paul when he was preaching in what Caesarea Philippi and 30 people and he didn't even know 30 guys dedicated themselves not to eat or drink anything till they had killed Paul and they vowed together you know and said we're gonna kill this guy you know I mean what is up with that dude he's in prison he's not really you know but but you know the enemy just stirs people they don't even know why I just hate you. I just rip your face off. I, I just love you. <laughs> and, you know, and of course, you know, Paul didn't die in 30 days. I wonder, did they eat? <laughs> and our conclusion would be, I bet you they did. That's right. I bet. You know, ah, but now, you know, and then he's eventually carried away to Rome, they didn't go, oh, go to Rome and get him, you know? They're going, I got an idea, let's eat! <laughs> let's go to Mickey D's! <laughs> now these, you know, this is great stuff and funny stuff, but wait till your adversaries have only one desire and that is to heap affliction upon you especially when you're down and out because bullies one thing I learned about bullies is they only pick on the weak and they pick on people when they think they're down and out and can't defend themselves <clears throat> and the devil is nothing but a big old bully that's all he is he's just a big old bully and and uh, these these adversaries will come I mean, again, what if this actually happens to you? Paul would say to you, what, what is the wording here? Uh, be not, um, uh, in nothing, in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Okay, well, that's fine, Jesus, but they're trying to kill me. You know, Paul could say that, right? They're trying to kill me. That's fine, Jesus, but they have dedicated themselves to destroy my reputation or to destroy my means of being able to support my family financially or, you know, my ministry or, you know, and some, some of you here are going to experience that. Are you going to remember this at the time? To in nothing be terrified by your adversaries. Why? Well, because the Bible says it. Because God doesn't want us wandering around in fear. So, okay, I'm just not going to do that. Well, good luck. If that's your only motivation, you will be terrified. Your motivation has to be based on reality. And your reality is, this is going to turn to the furtherance of the gospel because I am going to receive this and let and go into this death with Christ by Christ and if God raises me up that's his business but there will be a resurrection somewhere somebody will receive this 
You see why he would say, don't be, don't be terrified by your adversaries. But then he also goes on to say, well, you know, nothing be terrified because if you're that way, if in nothing you're terrified by your adversaries, well, come on. He already said that these guys are trying to add affliction, and if it's not adding, not adding affliction, that's going to hack them off even more. Isn't that right? If it's not, their purpose is to add affliction to you. They want to see you the next time after the, the affliction they've released, and they want you to be more beat down than you were before. But if they see that you're not terrified by that, you're actually doing pretty good. They're going to come to a conclusion that you are reprobate because how's the wording of that? Um, which is which is to them an evident token of perdition. This this proves you are evidently of the devil. You came from the pit of hell. That's what they said of Jesus, basically. They said he hath a demon. Now where would you, I mean, I'm always, you hear me say that from time to time because I'd just be fuddled by it. I mean, what did Jesus ever do that you could look at, but guess what? We can look at just normal things and see something that's not even there and go, you know what? Jesus just, Jesus just, you know, blessed everybody. And then when he turned away, he looked at me like, well, you're just a nothing. Yeah, we can see that, you know, we, we project that on his face. We go, look, he is so yucky. Can you believe? And then he gets up there and feeds the poor and acts like he cares about everybody, but that's what he says to me. You know, and you're just going, and then it starts eating your lunch. You're, oh, what a horrible person. And then eventually they hung him on a cross. <laughs> because that's the pattern. Is there any hope for not going to the cross? Not if you want Christ for him, didn't you? Je the, the Pharisees said to Jesus, here's that mentality that goes against to die's gain. They said, if you are the son of God, come down from the cross. No, if he's the son of God, he's going to stay on that cross. He is not coming down because to come down would mean we're all going to hell. Yes, he could come down. To choose coming down would be far better for him. Amen? Amen? You see, you see the choices? And do you see how with clarity Paul saw Christ crucified and saw that template, saw that pattern, began to, it's just like he put it on himself. And chapter 2, he really gets after it. It's just so good. Anyway, all right. Um, uh, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him but also to suffer for a sake. And I remember... You know, I read that when I was a fairly young Christian and even years later and went, what? I mean, it's given to me not only to believe on him but to suffer. That, that's not what everybody preaches. <laughs> they say it's given not only for you to believe on him but to reign with him and to be an overcomer and God will, you know. I can get the emotions up, but yeah, but eventually God's going to have to drag you down, so I don't, you know, I don't want to encourage, you know, <clears throat> you know, and I'm not even saying that, you know, those people aren't of God on any level, on, on certain levels or whatever, because my, my goal is not to put down the flesh. My goal is to lift up Christ and Him crucified. Do, do you, you see that? That's, that's, you know, if they're genuinely born again, they're my brothers and sisters. I don't care what they believe or how contrary to the one that I love with all my heart they believe things. 
if they're born again, they're born again of incorruptible seed, and that's Christ. Well, I claim I love Jesus, but I can't put up with a little bit of wrong doctrine or whatever. Can't we go into death over that? You know? You bet we can and will and want to. How shall they hear? I mean, how is it ever going to come to pass that it gets beyond, you know, our four walls? And I, you know, I'm not trying to get it beyond the four walls. I'm trying to get it in your thick little skulls right here. I ain't worried about the walls. <laughs> All right, sorry. But it's true. I mean, this, the, if Jesus had 12, he had 12, and he spent his whole life, three and a half years of ministry, with them, trying to get it in them. So we want to go, I want to have a big tent that seats 100,000, or I want a big cathedral, you know, with, you know, we say, oh, I want to have all these people, you know, we're, many of them are saying, I just want lots of tithers, people who give money, you know. Well, if that's what I was after, <laughs> I sure missed the mark. <laughs> all right, verse 29, for unto you it is given to behalf of Christ not only to believe, but also to suffer for his sake, and that for his sake is not just, it is, let me just say this, it is in line with everything that has been in the context before. Do you understand that? It is in line with a suffering that believes in life out of death. It doesn't suffer for suffering's sake. It is not into suffering. It is not pro-suffering. It is embracing a reality that is God because this is the way of God. Because this is the way of God. Um, so in verse 29, he then fortifies his statement in verse 28 with a presentation of the gospel that is not just about believing doctrines, but also concerns functioning by the same principles by which Jesus lived or Jesus lived and yet lives because it's still Jesus in us. Or is it? <laughs> but you, you know what I'm saying. I mean, <laughs> I mean, yes, he's in there. But is he doing the living? Because if he's doing the living, there will be a compassion for the people that are saved but don't know him. There won't be a mistreatment foul attitude and spirit towards them. I'm sorry. Jesus didn't, you know, if anybody ever had a right to have that, Jesus did. He came from glory. He came where everything was perfect, nothing out of whack, no belief systems wrong, nobody with wrong motives, and he came down here. Everything's wrong. Everybody's motives are wrong. <laughs> Everything's dark and ugly. Way darker and uglier than we realize. You know why? Because we're dark and ugly, so we're used to it. <laughs> we go, oh, you know, dwelling in the cave with all these bats and crocodiles. You know, well, this is life, this is, you know. But look, we have a torch. <laughs> you know, life's good, you know. And we have no contrast. <laughs> Watch out for that gator. <laughs> yes. It's getting out of the cave altogether. You know, we think it's just helping us with our problems, but really it's removing us from all of that. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Don't put your lips on it. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> Verse 30. <laughs> Sorry, people listening to this, but I can never hold back when I see Mike Wallace at a certain place. It's like, I've got to take him over the edge now. <laughs> you know, I mean... When, when you listen to my preaching for 20, 30 years, 
It's two things you get. One is the preaching of the cross, and the other one is Mike Wallace is laughing in the background. <laughs> All right, verse 30. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. <clears throat> All right. Now, again, folks, can you see how we could read that or the verse before it or the verse before it in light of something that has nothing to do with the context? Can you see how that would be? <clears throat> Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Well, okay, <clears throat> if we're just, if we're just like literal, linear with it, what is that? Well, Paul's in prison. So that means all of the Philippians are in prison too. Because they're in the same conflict. Does that make sense? If, if you just take it a literal way, but that's not what he's saying. <clears throat> um, here he clearly hearkens back to his time of imprisonment while there with them in Philippians as well as his present situation in Rome. The explanation of this phrase, the same conflict, is not that these Philippians are also facing or enduring imprisonment, but they are confronted with situations where they can put self first and avoid trouble, or they can believe in the faith of the gospel that holds that selfless giving results in a greater increase of Christ. The same conflict is we're all faced with the opportunity to choose for self. That conflict goes on every day for everybody. That's not that you don't have to wait for imprisonment for that. You know, that is a constant deal. And so um, he is. Uh, and uh, well, let me let me just finish reading whatever I got here. Um, they have seen how this principle has worked in Paul's life meaning they've seen it when he made a choice. He could have chosen a death that would have just benefited him personally and would have been not wrong to be more with Jesus. But he didn't choose that. He chose a death for others. And so they have seen how this principle has worked in Paul's life, and he now calls upon them to live in the same manner. The next verse is the first verse of chapter 2, and it's a continuation of these thoughts that the apostle has been presenting up to this point. From now on, he will become more specific as to how this life is to be lived out. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is, um, we have talked in generalities, even though it may seem so specific, he is going to lay out a pattern that can be marked, uh, like a path that can be marked. This is the path, walk ye in it. You can know, regardless of how changeable life is, regardless of how um, um, the variety of, of situations and things, <clears throat> You can know the path with clarity, but you have to know Christ crucified beyond the atonement and beyond what the cross did to Adam. You have to. You have to open yourself to Christ crucified as he was and is and is to come. Or, another way of saying you have to open yourself to Christ, Christ crucified as he is comprehended as slain lamb on throne. Slain lamb on throne. Because he's not just lamb on the throne, folks. He's slain lamb on the throne. And uh, to do that <clears throat> requires your heart to just go into a deep travail to know Jesus. It, 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 a, a deep dissatisfaction comes not because anything's wrong. That's the neat thing about it. I love this thing. It's not because something's wrong, but it's actually 
you're crying out because something's right. The Holy Spirit has, you've, you, you know, you've, if I can say it, knowing they're not the best examples or wrong, but it's as if you have graduated from, um, how did Paul put it in Galatians 4? Galatians 3, from tutors and governors, from schoolmasters, that's, that's the actual term. You've graduated from schoolmasters now you're ready to move into sonship. You're ready to move into the son being the impetus, being your eyes so full. And again, that pattern can't just be written out, charted and put on there and go, I'm going to do that. See, if, you, if, that, if that's what you're expecting, that will happen, but that can't be it because that pattern comes from a certain creature, and that creature, again, is not Christ. It is Christ crucified. And we'll, we'll take even a whole section to give definition to Paul's uh, explanations, and it's in, it's in primarily in this book. I mean, he, you know, but his definitions of Christ crucified as described in this book. All right, let me have a drink and then we'll pray. Lord, I thank you for the, I thank you for the hunger, Lord, not for more Bible knowledge, but a deep, deep grumbling like stomach grumbling because it's hungry, a deep rumble within those that just want to know you and don't want to know you according to my preaching descriptions, but that your Holy Spirit has them in a place where they cannot be satisfied. They must know you. And because that hunger is so deep, Father, that even my pitiful attempt at words are being used to stir them and to bear witness in them and to draw them out of old places, old comfortable places, into new realms of the, of the promised land. I thank you that for those who don't even uh, know how they feel or if that's true of themselves, they are yet here. They, they came tonight and they are drawn by your spirit. Their mind may not just grasp everything. And they may not be jumping with excitement on the inside, but they are, by the, by the movements of the Holy Spirit, just like the, all the animals moved one day. They were about doing their normal living, and one day, Lord, it was as if you just snapped your fingers and they started toward the ark. Lord, we look in the world and we see all these things. Lord, the true ark is your son. And the true, true destiny is to come into the new world, the new creation as you see it and you know it. Nobody of the old could ever comprehend that, that journey in that ark. But you said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. And Lord, I sense a movement towards you, a drawing. So Father, I just pray that your will be done. 
Let your purposes be completed, not just in Christ, but in those who are joined with Christ. So that you may be glorified by Christ crucified. Now, Father, in closing, I just ask for special grace in the prayers of the saints that that this earthen vessel may be given grace to present the things in this, in this next chapter that I believe were on your heart. So, Father, open my mouth, fill it with your word, and open our hearts and let us all gather and feast with you around the table, enjoying your presence, feasting on your supper. We ask it humbly, but heartily, in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're dismissed.